Hello everyone and welcome to today's video. So in today's video, we're going to be going over the next step in genetic mapping, which is the three point test cross. You'll do lots of different examples of this if you are studying this at the moment. And this video, we'll walk through an example together. Now there will be two videos that are published after this. I believe the long hair version of me comes back because I recorded them earlier this semester. And one is a forward three point test cross and the second one is a backwards three point test cross. So those videos will be released in the days after this one. So be on the lookout for them. And those ones are the ones I want you to try and then watch the video. All right. So the best way to go over three point test crosses is to work through an example together. So the three and the three point is for three genes. So a three point test cross here are three incompletely linked genes in one test cross experiment. This saves tons of time. Remember the two, let's say we were comparing A, B, and C. In the two point cr test cross, you'd have to do a cross between A and B, a cross between A and C, and a cross between B and C. That's three different crosses, three different test crosses, three experiments. The three point test cross figured out a way to do them as one cross. So again, Thomas Hunt Morgan, Alfred Strudevant, Strudevant are the pioneers in this, and they developed the three-point test cross using Drosophila or the fruit fly. So let's work through an example together, uh, how they did this. So here, there are three re recessive mutations at three loci. And now these are just made up ones. Mahogany is MG. Well, not made up, but they're uh, an example in fruit flies. Uh, mahogany is MG. Agouti is A. Ragged is RG. So the dominant forms of these would be plus, plus, plus. So make sure you don't get mixed up on the pluses. And if it's a letter, it's the recessive form. So these are heterozygous at all three loci. And another important factor here is the parents are unknown. So we'll figure out what the parents are throughout this experiment. And then the mutant mouse, all three loci are mutant. So what we do know is if we're looking at this cross, you can write this out as MG plus, so the heterozygous for the parents, uh, MG plus, A plus, and then RG plus, cross all mutants. So that's what that would look like for the cross. You know, we don't like to write them like that anymore, especially with the letters, it makes it a little bit more confusing. Uh, so we wanna write these as chromosomes. And again, we don't know, oh, I forgot a plus there. We don't know if, this one is in cis or you know coupling or repulsion you know the parents unknown here but we can get it from the data so let's let's look at this data and try to figure this out so this is usually how the data is presented as a table like this so here it shows the phenotype so a rg plus so you know agouti mahogany and then whatever the ragged form or no um yeah and then whatever the, the uh ma this one's agouti, ragged, and then whatever the mahogany form is for the wild type. Sorry, I'm getting tongue tied today. Now here you can see the number of progeny that had that phenotype. And we see that for all of these. Again, these are phenotypes, not necessarily the exact genotype. And down here, I tell you the total is 223 progeny. So the purpose of the three point test cross is to make a sequence. You want to make a genetic map of the order of these and how far they are roughly away from each other. So I have this set up going through step by step by step, and we slowly work through the problem together. So here, step one is find a non-recombinant progeny. These are the two most common phenotypes. So let's look up here at the data. So two most common phenotypes, let's go to a blue color here. So non-recombinant, two most common phenotypes, so we see a 76 and a 69 here. So these ones are the non-recombinants. That tells you what the parents are. So our parents are A plus MG and plus RG plus. That's good to know. So here where we say parents are unknown, if they're non-recombinant, we know these are the parents. So if you look at them, that would make sense. Uh, so let's go on. So there, there are the non-recombinant progeny. I'm going to write them down here just to keep track of them. So hopefully I don't have to scroll up and down as much. Step two now, we want to find the double crossover progeny. Remember double crossover, DXO. So two least common phenotypes because this is this is tough to happen, 
for a double crossover to occur. Remember, so we have our, we have our gene and hypothetical, well, we have a chromosome hypothetical A, B, C here. To have this one switch, we'd have to get a double crossover occurring between this region and a double crossover occurring between this region right here to only move the middle one. So this information, the fewest amount of progeny, tells us the double cross, tells us the middle gene. So two least common phenotypes. Let's go up here, look at the data. Two least common are the first two. So you could just write a double crossover here and you know ARG plus and plus plus MG are the double crossovers. So we'll write them again down here. Next step then is to find the middle gene. And this will tell us the gene order. So how we do this, we, all we need to do is compare the non-recombinant with the double crossovers. Now to help us find the swapped gene. So that's one reason why I wrote them here. So let's look at this. We have plus, well, we have A plus MG. We have A, R, G plus. So little different than we have plus R, G plus, plus, plus M, G. So here we could figure out that A is the different one. How do we know that? Let's look. So A is right here. A is right here. The difference now is plus became RG, MG became plus. So that one was switched. So here, these two are different. And completely, I, I wrote these in the same order, you know, as this one being the first one and this one being the first one down here, just to make it easier to see. But it could be the other one. Now here, we have plus, we have plus, which is the A gene, and then we have RG, and then a plus. That one, these two are different. So what you want to find here is the one that's different between the two, well, the one that's the same between each of them. So here, A is the same. So that tells you A is the middle gene. And we can write that as A was swapped by a double crossover, which means A is equal to the middle. So don't let this table confuse you. When I say ARG plus, I'm not telling you the order. That doesn't tell you the order, it's just a phenotype. You could write this RGA plus, plus ARG. There's no, it's just however the user inputted the data for that phenotype. Then you look at the data to figure it out and write it the correct way. So we know our order now is MGARG. So again, we're just writing the recessive form out. So MGARG, we know A is the middle. Now, could these be the other way around? Could this be R, G, A, M, G? Yes, it could be. Uh, could very well be that. But I chose M, G, A, R, G to get through this. And now, I always recommend writing out the non-recombinant parents then. So here, A plus M, G, write it in the correct order now. So we have M, G, A plus, and this step helps you through the next one. And I'll write two bars here for the chromosome. Then the other plant parent is plus RG plus. So you write that the other way. We have plus plus RG now. So we're just reorganizing this one up here in the correct format. So right here are our parents. Boom. At the first, the parents were unknown. So we figured it out. And writing it like this will help you think for the next step for determining map distance. Because step four is to determine those map distances. How do we figure out what distance is between MG and A, and then A and RG? You have to calculate the recombination frequency. Remember the recombination frequency, the amount of recombinants divided by the total times 100. So we have to figure out the single crossovers. And that's sometimes the tough, the tough part here. So a single crossover, let's you know change colors here. Let's say a single crossover occurred on this side of the chromosome. So we just switched MG and plus. Now we wanna look for an arrangement that's plus A plus. Then also an arrangement that's MG plus RG. So remember, we're only switching this end down here. So plus A plus, if we go look at the table up here, plus A plus has 15. That's a single crossover 
between mg and a, which is 15. So I'll write that 15 down here as well, which we'll need later. The other one is mg plus rg. mg plus rg right here, single crossover mg to a, which is nine. So we'll add that nine down here. Now let's look at the other end. So now we're looking from A to RG, a single crossover there. If we rewrite this one, like I said, I always recommend rewriting them. And I've gotten a habit of writing them like this above each other. So you know what to look for in the other table. So we have MG, A, RG. And then we have plus, plus, plus. Easy one. Um, so let's find a plus. Plus, that's right here. That's 16, single crossover, A, R, G. And we know the other one is a single crossover, A to R, G as well. So that's 36. So we have a 16 and a 36, A, R, G, M, G. So let's write those numbers in. Boom. Okay. So why did I just do all that? It'll help us visualize the next step and walk us through it. Because now we need to calculate the recombination frequencies. So we calculate recombination frequencies by calculating N1 and N2. So then we can get the distance from MG to A and the distance from A to RG. That makes sense. So N1, middle recombination frequency, we have the single crossovers plus the double crossovers because remember, these are still a recombination event. So it needs to be included here. Divided by the total times 100. So N1, we're looking MG to A or the brown color or the orange color here. So this is equal to 15 plus nine. Now don't forget about the double crossovers. So plus one, plus one. Easy to forget about all divided by 223. I gave you the total. If I don't give you the total, you just add up all these numbers. So then this is equal to a recombination frequency of 11.66, which we can just say 11.7. Remember, that's 11.7 map units. Oh, this was all also times 100. Can't forget that. N2 is the other one. So the N2 is looking at A to RG. And then just to write this one in quick, we have 16 plus 36 plus 1 plus 1 divided by 223 times 100. And don't forget these plus ones. This will throw off your answer. They're easy to forget. It's easy to forget those double crossovers, but don't forget them. So this one's equal to 24.2%. So now we can construct our map. We know our distances. So MG to A is 11.7 map units. A to RG is 24.2. So we can write our map out. 11.7 between MG to A. So we can draw our chromosome here. MG is first. A is 11.7 away. Map units, don't forget your units. And then A to RG, not the scale again. Uh, this is 24.2 map units. So, oh, and this is RG. So MG to RG, you can just add these up. So 11.7 plus 24.2, roughly 36 map units. But remember, this distance, the higher the recombination frequency, the higher the likelihood of double crossovers interfering with that. So keep that in mind for this one here. Now we can actually look into that. So based on these recombination frequencies, so we're taking this one step further today, we can look at the expected number of double crossovers versus actual. So in this, we got two double crossovers total. How many would we expect based on these recombination frequency. So one thing that could happen with double crossovers, you have a double crossover here. And if you have another gene that's really close, this double crossover would actually interfere with this one and then it wouldn't occur. So that's called interference. So we're gonna look at that now. So to calculate the expected number of double crossovers versus actual, we need to calculate the expected. So we can actually use these two recombination frequencies of 0.117 and 0.242 to calculate that. So expected equal to each recombination frequency times each other. Why that works, just trust me on it right now. 
So this equals 0 0.028. So we know we have 223. We expect 0 0.028 or 2.8 percent of 223 to be double crossover. So to figure out how many of those 223 are double crossovers, you take 0 0.028 times 223, and that gives you 6.3 double crossovers expected. Based on these recombination frequencies, we should have roughly six point. Can you have 6.3? No, you can have six or you can have seven. Again, it's a rough estimate, but this is how many we expect. We only solve two. So because of that, we can calculate something called the interference. This is the the degree to which one double crossover event interferes with another. So how do we calculate this then? Uh, first we have to, so this I is interference. So interference is equal to one minus the coefficient of coincidence. Of course, we're gonna throw in another term here. So the coefficients of coincidence is equal to the number of observed double crossovers. So in this case, we observed two double crossovers over the number of expected. So two over 6.3, is the coefficient of coincidence. The so two over 6.3 is 0 0.317. Now, interference is equal to one minus that, which equals 0 0.683. Now, what does that mean? We can get our final result then. So 68.3% of double crossovers will not be observed. So it's pretty cool that you can calculate that. So you, you know that your double crossover number in your actual data up here is off. So we only saw two. We should have seen six, but because of the how far away these genes were. So if the genes are really close together, you can actually have a negative um, interference. That's possible. So that means they would be highly, you can have all of them not to be observed, which would make these results tougher to analyze. But this is just showing it a nice way. So you can also take this number and then calculate how many double crossovers there were. So if I give you the total, that's the working backwards problem that we'll get to later. All right, but that's all I have for today. So, you know, the focus of today was how can we make this genetic map based off this data? And if you go through each of these steps, you can write down these steps so that when you're practicing these problems on your own, you get used to which steps to do. You can do this on your own then. Uh, so the next video will be an example problem similar to this, where you go through the steps and find the genetic map. And then the video after that will be giving you the gene order and then you working backwards. I'll also give you the uh, interference as well and you'll calculate it.